chamber was in the conductor's seat by the doorway, clutching the ticket holder, savoring the weight of the iron rod, cool to the touch, to which the sticky tickets were strung like ribbons. In the distance, the white petals of the lotus temple opened up to the sun, and Chetan thought of me. Of the afternoon they spent together at the temple, sitting with her on the wide steps, then in the garden, legs stretched out on the grass, shoulders touching, she in her green salwar and white the panta with, her lips and tongue red from the old color and ice. From the street beside the bus, a boy's voice reciting a list of destinations filtered through to him. The shopper's job was to recruit passengers, fill the bus. But the boy was only 15 and new to this line of work. Chandu stuck his head out of the window and spat. Why do you speak shop, soft and shy like a bride? Pound on the side of the bus. Yell. Get everybody in. On his cell phone, there was a missed call from Hema, a woman he had seen for one month, following his separation from Pintu, trying to erase her from his memory. But he realized that he didn't like Hema after all and had abandoned her, although there was no logic. Hema was pretty, a laborer from Rajasthan who had been making good money as a housemaid in a government official's home by Delhi. She was kind and caring. If he hadn't met Ethan, he probably wouldn't have had too much to complain about with Hema. But even, at, even two months after he'd ended relations with her, she still called him now and then. He always ignored the comments, thinking it kindest not to respond at all. But each time he felt Just like the boy, Chengdu was a shouter too, but today he was the conductor. With the tempting prospect of making it a permanent fixture, fixture if he did well enough. For seven years, he had been working for Padilla, the owner of the private bus service, King Lines. Padilla was a tough butcher with a point of beard and a habit of summoning his employees to meet with him in his shop, but then ignoring them throughout the meeting, closing his eyes when they talked or interrupting. Promotion, conductor promotion. The racket of the Luka. And he has smoked. Gur, 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 like a shaitan breathing. No. Of course, that was Padilla's answer to most everything, no matter the question. But Chandu persisted. Finally, Padilla seemed to relent. Bring in 10,000 rupees in one day, then we will see. If he became a real conductor for good, afford to leave the hustling and the swearing behind. Instead, he'd wear a smart khaki uniform and go about saying, tickets please. His mother was fond of neat clothes, uniforms with perfect creases. She was disallowed color, but she liked color, and she never got used to wearing widow's wear. She was all too young when it happened. His father worked night shift construction because of the higher pay and he was coming home in the early hours one time, and someone mistook him for someone else and stabbed him in the street near the white junction. A sweeper found the body in the morning, and the news did not reach the family until the next day. A year later, when Chengdu was 10, his mother passed away and had fallen ill during the cold day. Does this bus go to Chapter Jung Hospital? Hospital? An old man stood at the doorway, skeeting, squinting up for Chandu. He wore a blue turban and carried a walking stick, torso wrapped in a black shawl. The bus did not go to San Francisco, not even close. But the policy in the King of Bus Lines, established by long practice, was that one did not turn away an air being passenger. And besides, Chandu needed all the ticket money he could muster today for a possible kind of promotion. Chandu nodded and Without looking at the old man, instead he frowned and pretended to be busy counting the tickets. Get in, get in, get in! The old man smiled and opened his eyes. Oh, how long I've been waiting here. Bless you, my son, bless you. He 
started to climb the steps into the bus carefully. Hurry up, Grandpa! The boy was now sitting still in a hesitant, eager voice. Damn it, boy, said Chandu. You want to make me do your job for you? Is that what you want? Chandu got up from his seat and joined the bar and said, You don't know how to shout? You got a voice in there, you sister fucker? Chandu spat out of the room and bellowed in a booming voice. Nizamuddin, Pogol, Kalkaji, get in, everybody get in. He signaled to the bus. Come on, the bus is leaving. Closer to what we perceive as the 
present. Um, so, and knowing that quite a few of us in here are writers um, and people who are <coughs> publication, I'm trying to keep this relatively craft oriented, and that's okay. Um, so, research. You all have projects at different times with different degrees of uh, or in different degrees of maturity. How did the research process work for each of you? Is there anything? Um, some people are incredibly detailed researchers. Others do it on the fly. <laughs> Remember, uh, there's a quote from Philip Roth about writing. Um, the plot against America, so he read four books. He <laughs> checked them out from the library. That was it. That was the extent of the research. Um, <coughs> uh, well, first of all, I'd like to put my uh, high school mascot up against yours. Uh, we were the Deerfield Doors. Whoa. Our mascot was a door. <laughs> <laughs> 17th really cool. century door. I think, I think there might be a real competition there. Um, no one's favorite mascot. <laughs> uh, so I'm, I'm really lucky to be at a research, research institution. It means that um, quite a bit of the time that I'm meant to spend in, in the place is dedicated to research. So um, I spent about three years in the library that we had looking at microfiches, getting really familiar with the Atlanta Journal, um, the Atlanta Constitution. I'm from Atlanta. Uh, I subscribed to, um, or didn't subscribe, but I got to use some research money, and this is one of my favorite things that I've ever gotten to purchase uh, using university funds, all of the 1962 Playboys. Um, and my department manager, when, when they came in, uh, you know, I bought them on eBay, and when they came in, she brought me to her office, and she held them up, and she said, <coughs> do you have an explanation for this? And I said, yes. Um, I'm writing a book that takes place in 1962, and it's really important for me to see how the world and the country was responding to this major event. Um, I also did a lot of looking at Life Magazine, uh, probably the best Thing that I found was a copy of Jet from 1962, which was about one-eighth the size of a Life magazine. Um, I scoured them for articles, I scoured them for commercials uh, in Life magazine. Probably the most striking thing to find um, was a do-it-yourself uh, bomb shelter and uh, how to build one in your backyard. Uh, but it was, it was a long, lonely process in the library. Uh, and, and what was so much fun was just encountering things that I, I wasn't expecting, and the way that those surprises really informed, ended up informing um, character decisions, plot development. writing fiction or writing um, nonfiction, in my case literary criticism, 
I think it's important to be completely immersed. Right? And to, to you know, do the Playboy magazines. For me it was hard verse. It was a little less <laughs> less uh, salacious, but it was it was hard verse. Um, I read a lot of Harper's magazines from the late 1860s and uh, early 1870s, so I was much of that. And uh, lastly, I think location is very important for research, especially if you're writing fiction and you're trying to create a sense of place. Um, so I did a lot of trips to see actual places and walk on actual streets. Um, I think that's not, what, like sort of just walking around is not what we think of as real research. I think it's real. I think research um, it informed my sense of space, my, my sense of direction, my sense of climate um, for this. And, and I think that goes for nonfiction too. Um, when I was writing on Dickens, I, I did a number of trips to London for research, but also did scoutings to neighborhoods that he had written about or seen scenes from you know the novel, but I tried to find a place where Lady Dunlock collapses in Bleak House. And it just changes your relationship, I think, with the material in a way that makes it um, deeply personal to you, right? Because all sorts of things are going on in your life during the research process. And you know, I remember things in my life when I was doing that London trip. And I think the more you can personalize it, the more enjoyable it becomes. And that makes it much more likely that you will continue it and, and see the process through. I feel like I should sing if I'm going to hold a ring. <laughs> but I, I won't do that, okay? Um, I'm really uh, interested in the relationship of recording and storytelling. So for me, the difference in the contract between, <clears throat> the difference is in the contract with the reader. So if I'm presenting something as nonfiction, everything in it that, that seems like a fact is a fact. Um, if I am presenting something as fiction, it might be true, but it doesn't matter whether it's true. So I did a, a redneck way of knowledge um, is kind of narrative nonfiction. Um, I, I was what we used to call Gonzo reporting. Um, I mean, if, if the Pope is giving mass in Yankee Stadium and the altar is on the second base. That is a great opportunity for a narrative nonfiction writer. <coughs> I mean, what are you going to say about that? <laughs> you can't report it straight. <laughs> Come on. Um, but uh, in, in my last book, um, Tomb of the Unknown Racist, I'm, I'm very interested in, when, when I wrote this novel, I did a lot of research. I grew up in the extreme right, um, and, and I know a whole lot about white terrorists, white extremists. Um, and because I grew up with white supremacists, I feel like I understand how they think. And so I felt able to take them on. Um, the, uh, when I first, this novel was rejected by my publisher twice, and they had published the first two, the trilogy, um, and my agent fired me. So I felt like, man, I'm on to something here. <laughs> Nobody wants to hear what I'm saying. And the key, I read, was that I put at the beginning a, a page in italics that says facts. So that you know that I'm not making this stuff up. There really was a group called the Silent Brotherhood that was killed in a shootout with the FBI in 1984. Um, there really is a novel called The Turner Diaries uh, that um, is a, a post-white revolution novel that is like a Bible for many white extremists. Um, uh, Timothy McVeigh, the guy who bombed the Oklahoma City building, he had pages of The Turner Diaries in his car when he was caught, including, guess what, it's been around for a long time, the directions for how to make a fertilizer bomb was right in that book. Um, this kid who shot up the church in Charleston, these, these people are, are heroes to each other. And so I felt like somebody ought to take this on. And, but if I didn't have that list of facts at the beginning, you wouldn't believe the story I'm telling. Because the narrator's brother was supposed to have been killed in that silent brotherhood thing. But it turns out he's alive. So 
so it's about this kind of retired radical lesbian based kind of on the internet, finding out that her very dangerous brother is still alive and what to do about it, what is her responsibility, because the trail of destruction that he caused before has continued. So that was, it's, it's all mixed up. The story's made up. I mean, I ran in Charleston, which is where a lot of it is said, because that's where I'm from, and my real brother was sitting in the front row, and I said, I just want to say it's my real brother, <laughs> and he is a really good sport. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, this brother is made up. Um, and I'm not the narrator of the book. People always think I'm Helen Burns, the narrator of these books, and I'm not. I mean, I'm probably more like Helen than somebody else is. <coughs> um, Helen is a made up character. The redneck way of knowledge? That's Blanche. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if that's any help. You know, I, I'm not a researcher. I, I needed to find a cave for my imagination in New Mexico, and I needed a Pueblo Indian tribe. I had to learn a lot about Native Americans. I had to learn a lot about Pueblo tribes so I could make up a tribe that nobody was going to think was a real tribe. And it turned out I couldn't find a cave, um, but I did find something that substituted for it. Um, so I asked, asked uh, one of my students wanted to go with me to New Mexico to see how I do this research. And when I got there with him, I thought, what was I thinking? He's going to find out that I don't do anything but ride around. I just ride around thinking about what I'm writing. worked for me so far, and maybe it still will. That's plenty for me. Thank you. Hi, good morning everybody. Um, I think that the, the relationship between fiction and, and non-fiction, as we call it in um, Europe, is, a, is an artificial one, is a fascinating one. Like, basically, I mean, Booksellers tend to have a section, fiction and a section, non-fiction, and people who uh, give the, the literary prizes, either you get it for fiction or for non-fiction. But I think that there are many books which could come under the category of fiction and of non-fiction. Yeah, so I think it's, it might be practical for booksellers' purposes, but I'm not sure whether it's practical for writers' or, or readers' purposes, uh, because fiction often feeds non-fiction and non-fiction shares a lot of characteristics of, of fiction and I also teach creative writing and, and the very first assignment that I always give my students is that they have to go out and uh, use their eyes and their ears they have to observe you know, I call it a kind of uh, look and listen log book right because many, many, many people who come to creative writing have this idea that what they have to use is their imagination, their fantasy. Um, and I feel that if, if you're going to write, whether it's fiction or non-fiction, you have to start by using your ears and, you, and your eyes. You have to observe, you have to see. There is so, so much in what one can call the real world. And I know that you can argue, is this the real world? What is the real world? Well, anyway, well, let's call it for convenience sake, the real world. There is so much there that you can use, that, that is kind of present from the good Lord, if you like, uh, that you can use to build a character, build a plot, have um, a setting, right? You need, you need the setting for your, for your characters, right? So I always tell my students that there is so much that you can steal and, and nobody is going to be cross with you, like even if, if you model a character on your mom, for instance, right? Even if your mom says, doesn't that character look a bit like me? Because no, 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 mom. I mean, she's got a different name, and she's you know, you're 60, and she's 63, or something or other, you know? So you, you, you can do a lot of stealing in this so-called uh, fiction, right? And, and I basically think, I often find that often the, the, the first novel that people write tends to be highly autobiographical, hard word to say. Um, and often it's that people have to get something off their chest, right? But they don't dare to say it uh, in a non-fictional way, so they sort of hide it, this kind of masquerade, like, like this. It's, yeah, it's, if you like, it's therapeutic, I presume. Um, so then you can say, well, is this fiction? Well, it's fiction, but it's based on 
on non-fiction, on non-fictional experiences. On the other way around, uh, when you're doing non-fiction, and I've done quite a bit of non-fiction, and I have enjoyed it greatly, uh, you find that there is always the point uh, where you you can't proceed any further, right? So you can you can study all the available documents, you can interview all the people that are still alive, you, you, you can go to various places, and then at a certain point you, you have to realize, okay, now there are so many interesting details and so, so many interesting facts, but there is a lot that still remains hidden and will probably remain unknown forever. And one of the, the things that will remain unknown forever is what, what goes on inside people's minds, right? So, which is, I also tell my students that one of the weird things is that fortunately, none of us can read one another's minds. And I'm saying fortunately, because some of you maybe are bored to death, and luckily I don't know right now, okay? Uh, <laughs> maybe some of you are thinking, what is that stupid woman babbling about? And I don't know, okay? So I, I, th I always feel, thank God, we cannot read one another's minds. And even the person that you're having sex with, you don't really know what is going on inside that person's mind. Thank God. But, the weird, <laughs> but, yes, no? but the weird thing is that when we read a novel, and I think that's one of the reasons why people like reading novels, we are inside somebody's mind. It's, we have, in fact, the most intimate relationship that we can have, we have with characters in a novel. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Right? I think that's why we read, because we can be inside the character's uh, mind. Uh, but whatever research you do, even when you read diaries, you can't be certain whether a person is being truthful in the diary, right? And I remember, you all know, of course, Sylvia Plath. Um, so much has been written about her and her fateful marriage to Ted Hughes. When you read the biographies, yeah, the, the, the biographers go and, and interview people who have known them, who have spent holidays with them, and you get all these conflicting accounts, depending on whether the person likes Sylvia Plath better than Ted Hughes and vice versa. Right? So even people who were there uh, cannot fully be trusted, not that they are liars, right? but because we, we inevitably always are, are biased. Right? Um, so you always, also in nonfiction, what I like to do when I, when I write nonfiction is that there is this point where I like to fill my, my head and, and my computer with, with facts. right? And, and then at a certain point, as, as has been pointed out by other speakers, you realize, okay, I, I can't go any further on this route. And what you, well, according to me, what you have to do then is sort of, you, you have to abandon all that research a bit. You, you have filled your head with it. It's all there. And then it's like when you make a loaf of bread, you know, you have to leave it for a couple of hours so it can rise. And so I have the feeling all these facts, I have to leave them, and then I walk around and I catch the train and all that, and while I'm doing that, this is sort of somehow <laughs> germinating, is that a word? Yeah. yeah, is that a word? Okay. And so, and then there is an interaction between all the facts and indeed my imagination. Um, and I certainly use my imagination to try it into people's minds. Yeah. Um, like I was saying yesterday in another panel that night with the whole Michael Jackson thing, I, I watched the documentary, the full four hours of them, and I was fascinated by them. But of course then you think, but what went on inside his mind? Whatever was he thinking? And of course, it will take a writer, a novelist, to tell us what was going on inside his mind, right? Because people can testify, and they can be truthful. And people who have known him intimately can testify, and maybe there will be some kind of. Did he keep diaries? I doubt it. So I don't think he would have kept diaries. But anyway, but I think it will take a novelist to to study all that material, to listen carefully, to read carefully, and then to try to make that imaginative leap towards entering that mind. And and I, for me, that is one of the crucial functions of literature of art, right? Okay, we can have all the facts, yes. And then I saw that you reach a point that you, that you say to yourself, now what? What do I do with all these facts? You know, I can just list the facts, but that will be rather boring. Nobody's going to read that. So you have to add something. 
And there at that point you, you have to add your own imagination, your own empathy, your own experiences. Um, so basically that's what I do and I find that great fun. <laughs> a bit of a reveal of how the sausage is made, I, I will say that one of the dangers of moderating a panel filled with accomplished and interesting people is that they don't only answer your first question, they answer the next three. Um, so I'm gonna leap ahead a bit. <laughs> and well, speaking of research, and kind of this, I think we all agree, this osmosis process that happens, so you gather this material, you process it, and maybe draft in different orders. I'd be curious to know that, just a quick one. Um, did any of you start drafting on like shady ground? <laughs> did you start drafting as a researcher? Is it concurrent with the project? Or all research first, then words on the page? You mean the first 20 drafts of what you've done? <laughs> <laughs> you write as you research? Or? With, with the latest book, and it's not the one that has been translated, but with the latest book, what I did was I did it as a kind of detective story. And it was like, I was trying to find out together with two other people the truth about their family. So it was twin brothers asked me, enlisted me to find out what really happened during the war, what they, the members of their family really did during the Second World War. And so they knew bits, and so I was interviewing them, and then we visited archives, and then we visited this and that. And it, I tried to do it like, because the, my problem is that many history books can be very interesting, but I also find them very boring. And I find when, when I start reading them, after the first couple of pages, I, I lose interest, right? And I think, come on, what a pity. These people have great material, but they don't have to, the skills to, to, to tell it in a fascinating, stirring way. So, so for me, in this day and age, with, with the internet, with, with the Netflix, with everything, the great challenge for writers is to keep readers reading. Now, we can't lock them up, you know? We can't chain them to a, to a chair or whatever. So you have to try and make it interesting. So I have, I had all these cliffhangers, right? So I, as I was discovering more and more, I was sharing that route with the readers, and then every so often I had a cliffhanger. We know now so and so, but will it turn out to be so and so? <laughs> well, what will we learn when we visit the next set of archives? And it works. People, some people have told me, which I thought was great. Like a friend said, yeah. I always read at night, and she said to me, I'm going to read your book. She said, ah, I said, tell me what you think of it. Oh, it will take a long time, she said, because I read in bed just before falling asleep, and I read two pages a night. I thought, oh my God, this is going to take a long time. And then the next week, she came up to me, and she said, I finished your book. It's great. It kept me out of my sleep. I'm very tired now, she said, but I loved your book. And I thought, yes, cliffhangers have worked. Right? So I think... You, you need, as a writer, you need a great, you need a story material, right? But you also need the skills to to present your material in such a way that people will keep watching. And I also tell my students, watch documentaries, watch exciting movies, look at the tricks they use to keep you watching, right? And, and like, basically, like in your story, I really want to know now what woman he's going to end up with, you know? But that sort of thing works. You sort of take a lot of curiosity. There are two women, and uh, what's going to happen? So I think a, a very powerful motor and motivation for reading is what is going to happen, right? You want to know, I'm, I'm, I'm still a child. Do, do you have that too, other people? That you have this childish desire to know what is going to, to happen? So even with, with nonfiction, you can, is this, white supremacist, supremacist going to remain a white supremacist or is he going to be redeemed or whatever? <laughs> yes, yes. Uh. Um, I'm, I don't even know what I want to say. Yeah. Uh, the, the, I think that the distinction between fiction and nonfiction is important. It has to do with what are you telling the reader, what, whether to trust you. What makes it so confusing is that the early novels were presented as history, the history of Maul Flanders. The whole point of fiction is to make you believe it's true. So with nonfiction, you're having to say, it really is true. And you know, there's a lot of ways to do research. So if you want to write about somebody jumping out of an airplane, you better go jump out of an airplane, okay? Um, 
and, but then sometimes with real things, there's something interesting that you can do. The, Susan Smith, the know who that is, she's a woman, she drowned her children in a car, she rolled her, the car into a lake. Well, um, I, I, I covered that. And uh, uh, part of the way I, I did research was I took Susan Smith's handwritten confession and I took my sister's van and I rolled it down that ramp over and over with that confession on the seat beside me until I felt like I understood what it felt like to feel like that with your kids in the back seat asleep. I finally realized she was trying to kill herself. You can, you can try to chop your own head off and you'll duck because the body wants to live. And I, I became fairly convinced that Susan Smith tried to kill herself with her children. Her body jumped out of the car. It was too late. Or she thought it was too late. Part of the irony is that it wasn't too late. The car flew for six minutes. It was pitch black out. You know, so to do that kind of research, um, I, a lot of the time I'm just trying to understand what is going on? What is going on here? What is this person feeling? Why is this brother still a terrorist? What does he think? What about his daughter who's half Vietnamese? What about his grandson who's part African American? What is he still thinking? How is he doing this stuff? What's making him tick? I want to know that. I want to know that. Anyway, that's kind of how I do it. So. <laughs> survivors. Um, 
And that was the very first thing that I encountered, and I stopped immediately, and I wrote that chapter. And that chapter is the opening chapter, mostly because I couldn't imagine, I, but I wanted to, and I tried to, and that is our job as fiction writers, to do that work, to, to have that imagination. But I, I couldn't imagine how awful that must have been in Atlanta to hear 121 are dead, 132 are dead, 130 are dead. There were two survivors ultimately, and they were, uh, as we used to call them, stewardesses, um, and they were French. So, so that's where the book begins, and I begin with very factual numbers in the opening paragraphs. And then I moved from there into fiction. Uh, and I moved into one of the five characters who's a linchpin for the novel. And I didn't look again at anything to do with him until I needed more information about him. I needed to know, uh, it was a very decadent time in Atlanta. It was um, you know, not the heyday of cultural and sexual and gender revolutions. It was just at the beginning. It was at the chaotic beginning, 1962, not 1968. Uh, so then I wrote as much as I could until I hit a wall, and then I went back to the research. And one of the second things that I found, um, and I, it stopped me in my tracks, so Brown versus the Board of Education, 1954. Um, Atlanta was not alone in uh, dragging its heels to actually uh, integrate their high schools. We waited until 1961, and then we picked uh, 12th grade. Um, to integrate, and the process was grueling. 132 junior African Americans had to apply to be one of 10 to finally uh, integrate 12th grade. Um, and so I stopped when I saw that information, and I thought, my first thought was, I have to have a character who was one of the 10. And then my second thought was, no. I have to have a character who was one of the 121 who hadn't been chosen. Because that was another moment where I thought, what must it have been like to be 17, to have applied for this incredible burden, um, <coughs> to have possibly wanted it? There are you know, the, the people around the country who did integrate, you know, not just in Atlanta, but in other cities, um, those, those ten, those five who integrated, uh, they have very, very conflicting versions and accounts of what it was like. Their parents were determined that they would do it. It was their desire to do it. Um, they felt like they were changing the world. They felt like their life was hell. Um, so I, I wanted to pick somebody who had wanted it and then at 17 had had this major uh, desire, this major life desire, stripped away from him. Um, and to be in Atlanta and to have the news a year later of this crash that killed 100 plus of Atlanta's wealthiest white citizens. And then to have Ivan Allen, who was the mayor at the time, say this was Atlanta's greatest tragedy. So now I have a character who's 18, who's really angry at, at the city, who's angry at the country, and who now has the mayor telling him that this, the death of 121 white Atlantans, is the worst thing that's ever happened to the city. Um, and I had a moment where I encountered that Ivan Allen quote during research, and, and I'll be completely honest, I read it and I thought, oh wow, that's such a great line. Wow, he's so right. On the same day, uh, and I'm writing from a very liberal point of view, um, on the very same day that I encountered that Ivan Allen quote, I also encountered a Malcolm X quote, and this goes back to what um, someone else was talking about, this idea of one experience or one event, right? Talking about uh, Sylvia Plath and Ted Hughes, one event, two completely different uh, ways of looking at it. So again, one event, the same number of deaths. Uh, Ivan Allen says, this is the worst thing that's ever happened to Atlanta. Well, on the other side of the country, uh, Malcolm X, during um, a protest, he said, it's the work of God. And he called on God to have another plane fall out of the sky every day. Um, and so when, when I encountered those two quotes, I knew that they had to inform this 18-year-old who, who's you know, got a heart of gold, 
but he's also got a lot of anger, and he's trying to figure out where where do I position myself? I'm not there. I'm not where Malcolm X is. I'm also not where Ivan Allen is. You know, and Martin Luther King, by the way, is 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 up and coming at this point, and he absolutely disavowed Malcolm X's quote. He said, absolutely not. Um, in fact, he he canceled sit-ins out of respect for the people who have died. Um, but for me, the the research is just. I go to it when I need it, when I hit a wall, but it's also about knowing when to stop, as John said, because I don't know about any of y'all, but I can be a terrific procrastinator when it comes to, to writing. When, when I'm in the middle of a book, I can find you know laundry to do that, that has two pieces in it. Oh, I better, I better get that laundry done or sweep my floor. Um, so, so research, I think, can be, for some people, procrastination, and I try not to let it be that. I also hope never to do more research beyond my own life and stealing from it, which I also do quite a bit. Something I would like to say in response to what you said, that it's, it's our job to try and imagine what it was like. I think it's very interesting because I remember a talk given by John Kutse a number of years ago in Amsterdam, and he had this character What's her name? Costello. It's a woman character. He's written quite a few stories with her as a central character. And, and she has to give, so he's writing a story about a woman who has to give a talk in Amsterdam. And he gave a talk in Amsterdam about a woman who had to give a talk in Amsterdam. Sort of thing. So he was hiding behind this uh, character. And she said she had been reading a book about the German Nazi officers, officers who tried to kill Hitler in 1944. Stauffenberg or something like that. Anyway, now um, the plot obviously failed, uh, the attempt to kill him failed, and the, the, the culprits, the ones responsible, they were slaughtered in a horrible way. And this woman, the character in Kutze's book, had been reading a, a novelistic account of their death, their very, very cruel death, and she said that she felt. Uh, that scene should have remained unwritten. That the, the, the writer of that book, are you still with me? It's a bit complicated, but the writer of the book should not have gone there. It should have remained off stage. That was the, the term she used. And I remember going up to John Kutze afterwards and, and, and challenging him a bit over this and wondering whether, whether isn't it the, the task uh, of the writer to try and uh, go everywhere and enter all minds. Um, and, and I remember him saying, well, that his character writer, he did not respond for himself. He said, she's very tired, she's old, she's 60. She said, I often think of that because I'm 63 now. And I think, oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Elizabeth Costello, that was her name. You can Google her anyway. It's quite well known. And then I was thinking with the, the book I did was also about <coughs> a case of, um, of, of a rapist somebody who kidnapped, uh, unfortunately true, not fictional, he kidnapped uh, people, locked them up in the, in the cellar, abused them and then and killed them. And, but in this book there is no such scene. I, I felt that I shouldn't venture there. And the reason I didn't do it, because there was a trial, and at the trial the, the, the one where two girls survived their ordeal, and Sabine back then she was at the time, poor girl. Uh, she she refused to, to talk about what actually have happened on, on, on sexually, right? She didn't want to go there. And then I felt, okay, she installs a kind of taboo there, and I felt I have to respect that because you're dealing with real people. So I didn't want to. And I remember um, the one thing she said, as I read in the account, was that after he forced her to have oral sex, he gave her a chocolate and he felt, God, I'm such a good person because I care about her. I give her a chocolate to, to take away the, the horrible taste out of her mouth. I used that detail, but I used it for his wife. Right? So I really felt, I feel that there are also some ethics involved in being a non-fiction writer and entering lives of people that you wouldn't be able to enter in real life. Now we have kind of Kind of power as non-fiction writers, like they, <clears throat> like there's a Dutch writer who's done 
a book about Sylvia Plath and, and I'm pointing to her because she's my publisher. Uh, and she knows, of course, that I'm talking about Connie Palmer. She's done a book about uh, fictionalizing the dead Hughes and Sylvia Plath. Thing, you know? and, and I think they're a very good example because people are so fascinated by, by them, their story and their sort of angel. If you think about it, it's it's in fact an intrusion of the of the privacy of people, the privacy of people. We have a right to go. There. So I, I, for myself, installed a kind of uh, taboo and a kind of limit. I felt uh, I, I can't do this to these real people because they're still alive. I, you know, I, I have to somehow respect their their privacy. And I, I think it's a very interesting. Um, so this this duty that you have as a writer to enter all minds is there. Is there a limit to how far we can go? <laughs> Yeah, but we do exploit. <laughs> so it's a strange relationship between, because also there's an extent of fidelity to historical figures, which is weird. Which is why better get him right, or his 18th great grandchild, like you said. Um, but it's true to whatever extent. Um, and I have a lot more to ask, but I also know or would hope that uh, also the audience have questions for our wonderful Yes, yeah. Um, I kind of have a question. I think anyone can. book on the crash that happened at Orly. It's called Explosion of Orly by Ann Abrams. And that was the first place I started. Um, and it, it is, it's a very good book. Um, it is incredibly informative and it, it pointed, her research made my job so much easier. So I'm very, very grateful to it. It is also, it is a very generous look at Atlanta and at the people who died. Um, it is, it's a book that made, I think, all of the families very happy and it, it, it skirted some difficult topics. Uh, so I started there, um, found you know, in, her, in her index the, the other books that I needed to consult that would point me in even better directions, but, but I started there and it's from, it's from her that I found that information about the 132 African Americans, um, stuff that I hadn't known, so I'm really grateful for it. Uh, but I started with that one book that I already knew existed because I also knew that in Atlanta, everyone else knew about that book and I had to be fluent with it. It would have been an irresponsibility, you know, I couldn't just show up and say, well, because I'm from Atlanta, I can do this. I needed to be familiar with um, with with that and, and with the manifest and with the people and the time. So I just started with that and, and then moved to fiction and then moved whenever I had to back to the research. It was really similar for me because there was um, uh, a book on uh, a guy named William Humber who was the first spirit photographer in the U.S. working in the 1860s and it was just sort of like everything is in their collection of letters and newspaper articles and wasn't exactly a biography, but I, I found that book one day in a bookstore, which is how I got the idea to write the book about spirit photography, and then I created my own character based on him. Um, but that's kind of, there's a lot of luck. For, I mean, for me, that was luck that I was walking by myself that day and got that book. Um, but I think more pertinent to answer your question is that there is no formula for research. The key is to be open to sort of all things. The first bit of research can be a conversation that you're having with someone. I'm working on I have a research project right now, a nonfiction one. It's involving tons of interviews. I didn't really do any interviews for this, or most of, I'm not an interviewer. This is a kind of a new frontier for me, and it's becoming turning into this ethnographic project, um, which entails another kind of responsibility. But um, it can be a book. It can be little shreds of paper that you find, and I think it's important to, during, especially that initial research phase, I was really hate research, <laughs> um, to just have your eyes wide, wide open, to just suck in everything that's around, and 
that the, the piece that you think is not as important as, say, the book version of the research might wind up being you know, a really significant piece. So I think the key is to just be really open and to, and to let everything in, especially in those early stages. For me, the point is to write something that matters. If I'm writing fiction, I want to write something that matters, because fiction is too hard to write. You don't think you've got something at stake that is something that you're giving to people that that, that needs to be out there. Then I don't know the point. Now, nonfiction, I, I sort of have the same attitude of, of uh, if it, what I teach my students is, if it interests you, it's probably interesting, okay? About 5% of the time you're going to find out no it's not, okay? But most of the time, if you can really follow well what interested you, um, you're going to find out that there's something interesting in it. Um, I also do things because I'm asked to. I would have never asked to do the Susan Smith story, the, the, um, the paper asked me to do it. Um, but uh, there's a book by David Braun called uh, Killers of the Flower Moon, the Osage Murders, and the Founding of the FBI. Um, and let me brag and say that David was my student. Um, he, he said that he was doing research on something else and he ran across this line about the Osage murders. And that became the door that he went through. It turned out that the Osage Native Americans, the Osage per capita, were the richest people in the world for a few years until the whites surrounding them began to assassinate them. And that's what the book is about. It also goes into being interested in how the FBI was founded. Because the FBI was founded partly as a because the Oklahomans were handling this. You know? um, so, you know, sometimes what a little thing says that interests you opens a big door. But you have to trust that if you're interested in it, Where would the walls have actually 
thin. Um, because in this situation, I mean, it's this sort of scampering situation. It's not, he can't just sort of walk to a place where he feels like he can the plan. He has to hide in corners and he has to kind of go around this thing and then he gets into a door on the side of the convent. So that neighborhood became really important for me. And I walked around there a lot and I spent a lot of time on those streets um, just imagining, you know, what, what it would have been like if it was. You kind of also, I think you have to, um, if it doesn't work, you have to change it, right? For, fortunately, for this particular instance, it worked. In other situations, it doesn't work, and you have to just because I think what Blaine said earlier is you do want it. Fiction needs to feel real. It's sort of a, it's a bit of an irony about it. I've actually done that before, but it, it really needs to feel real, um, or it's not going to work for the reader. You're just going to lose them um, if you can't have them suspend their disbelief. And in that particular situation where, I mean, I'm having someone try to not escape from Maryland the way most, you know, most slaves escape from the upper and so not the deep so. Um, so this is a very special situation that I had to make it really convincing. And I feel like what helped with that was this geographical research. But, but, but I think if, if you don't have to have such detailed knowledge, I mean, it gets out weird, but Google Earth is very helpful. Uh, I remember that I was going to set I was going to set a scene in Rouen and I was planning on going to Rouen and then, but I sort of checked out hotel rooms actually and I found out that all of Rouen can just walk around to Rouen digitally. Yeah. So that's one of the weird realizations that because of Google we don't have to travel as much. It's good for the CO2. We have time for one more question. I do a woman character. I'm 
absolutely certain that this is what she thinks, feels, does. With a male character, I mean, obviously, and I've done male characters, and I think it's fun. It's one of the fun things about that you can impersonate people that you aren't yourself, so you escape from the boundaries of your own life. Uh, but you're never entirely certain. And I, re I remember once doing a bit of research there, and I asked the man, <laughs> what does it feel like having a penis? And he said, it feels, I mean, that's what this person said. Okay, that's what this person said. I'm not saying it's a general truth. But he said, it feels like walking around with a knife in your trousers. I thought, okay, that's an interesting answer. So I wrote an essay, the man, the knife, and his pieces. <laughs> but you know, there is, there is always, I feel, a certain point. Um, the same with like doing, uh, I'm Belgian, and I, I did a Polish character. And I know Polish people, but you still sort of, you, you don't have, when you, when you do your own character, your own background, your own gender, your own everything, you can be dead certain this is what the person does this thing. Um, no matter how much research you do, no matter how much you try to imagine and place yourself in another person's shoes, I feel you don't have that kind of absolute certainty. Yeah. And there is always the danger that somebody who does have absolute certainty is going to be angry with you. Like if, if, you're, if you are heterosexual, if you're a gay person, you can maybe offend a gay person because it's not like that. And what do you know? If you're white, you do the, 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 the African-American person, and that, that person can be cross because what do you know? So I find it very, very, very diff difficult. And I find that increasingly, uh, I feel that writers had a lot more freedom in the past. Now everybody's so sensitive and everybody's so think it's worse in the States than it's in, in Europe, actually. I would, I would also say, um, I would piggyback on the, it, it's, it is imperative that you have a reader who can, that you respect, um, and who will, who will look at what you've written. And um, I think it's also necessary to know what you're willing to change and what you're not willing to change. I think your motivation behind writing what you're writing is also, uh, it's very important that you know what it is and that you stand by it and you believe in it. Um, and I would also say that there is an excellent essay called In Defense of Appropriation, and it's a deliberately um, you know, inflammatory title, but it's by Keenan Malik, and he quotes Adam Schatz, a critical scholar, um, and, or a cultural scholar, but, but it talks about the danger of limiting our perspectives to only the characters that we know. And the minute that I am told that I'm only allowed to write from a white woman's perspective is the day that I stop writing. Um, because I'm not interested in that. I, I know how I feel and I know how I think, and that is awfully fun sometimes to write, but I, I believe, and one of the reasons that I teach creative writing I believe that it makes us better people when we read. I believe it makes us better people when we are forced to imagine another perspective. It makes us empathetic. So it's research plus empathy, plus make sure you're doing it for the right reasons and for reasons that you believe in and get yourself a reader. I would stay out of first person, keep, right? Keep in mind. Don't have a narrator that, that is a different skin color from you or don't have a, a gender from you you're going to end up in trouble. William Styron's novel, The Confessions of Nat Turner, written in the first person, is, as far as I'm concerned, a disastrous piece of work. That he never, the, the presumption that he could say, that he could, I mean, there, the Confessions of Nat Turner exist, that he tried to redo it through his, through his own really limited point of view. I think it was a big mistake. So for me, it's like, you know, it's about the narrator. I, mean, I can write, have all kinds of characters, but the narrator better be somebody that I have real confidence that I know who that person is. But it is true that people are much more sensitive. There used to be a lot more racism, too. So that's why there was a lot more freedom. Yeah, but if, if there is a need to write an essay in defense of appropriation, that's fine about the appropriation. I mean, you can write that essay, but I'm not going to do it. 
I'm, by the way, I'm not, I, I, I would never, I also would not write in the first person. Yeah, that's exactly, um, it's an important distinction. But I would write from, a, and I have written from a man's point of view in first person, um, and, and I'll do that till the cows come home. Um, and I also write often from the perspective of a woman with a child. I don't have children, um, but I'm going to continue to do that, and I'm gonna push limits, but I would never write in first person from, um, from a minority's point of view. I just would.